Good morning, everybody. So glad that you guys are here worshiping with us. Would y'all stand on up and we will get started in some worship. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. A Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Oh, can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song.
tested and tasted your grace And I was so lost till I fell at the cross And God saved, oh I got saved I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the How could I want more? The love of God gave me His pardon. The love of God won't let me stay the same. The love of God, it calls me up higher. His will is I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord And I'm restored and made right He got a hold of my life I've got Jesus, how could I want more? I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord
shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be Yeah. 
why you ever chose me It's always been a mystery All my life I've been told I belong At the end of the line With all the other not quite With all the never get it right But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time Said I'm just nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me Gave my heart a song to sing Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Moses had stage fright David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked twelve outsiders Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil start talking to me Saying, who's who you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody Saved my soul Ever since you rescued me you Gave my heart a song to sing I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus so Let me go down, down, down in history As another blood bond faithful member of the family and if they all forget my name well that's fine with me I'm waiting for the world to see nobody but Jesus so let me go down, down, down in history go down in history as another blood bond faithful member of the family oh, that's all I ever wanna be. and if they all forget my name Praising you this morning, knowing that there's nobody but Jesus that should be praised. We thank you so much for the, the gifts that you give to us. Lord, you're protecting us through this crazy time. And we need to look to you. But I just pray that as Jeff comes up and shares your word, Lord, please just speak directly through him. Encourage us. And keep us close to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome to our online service today. I so appreciate you joining us for this service and appreciate that, man, the wonderful music. They, I don't know about you, they just bless my heart every week. It just prepares my heart to preach, and I hope it prepares your heart as we, as we worship the Lord and get ready to receive His Word. And, and uh, hey, by the way, I want to let you know, we're looking and hoping and praying that we can have our coming back together in-person services on August the 30th, okay? That's tentative, but that's what we're, and we're going to do it right here in this sanctuary. So, man, we're really praying for that, and we, if we need to go to two services, we'll do that. But be in prayer about that, okay? We're really looking forward to it. But thank you for joining us today. I hope you're watching with your family, and I really want to encourage you to do that because, you know, it's so easy to get out of the habit. We're out of the habit of coming to church for some people, and, uh, and then, you know, on this online service, say, oh, I'll watch it later or this and that. But listen, thank you for doing that. I really want to encourage you to, to come as a family and sit down with your Bibles and let's participate in worship today, okay? You know, I miss our families. 
And uh, it's it's so encouraging when I get an email or uh, a text message or even a phone call or whatever and and to say, hey, man, our family's really enjoying it and God's speaking and he's working in our hearts and that blesses my heart. And I even got a, a couple of videos and I thought, you know, it's been so long since we, we've seen each other. And so I thought you might like to see these uh, little clips uh, from some of our families who are worshiping on, during the online service. Now, the family is Aaron and Karee Davis. And, um, you know, i, I got to set it up just a little bit. You know, they're, they're sitting in the den watching our service. And, and you know, little Hadley, their little girl, uh, her mom, Karee, is on our praise team and got an angelic voice, beautiful voice, praising the Lord. And so they're, they're watching this service, and it's the praise and worship time, okay? They're singing songs, and, and, and Hadley turns to her dad. You can't hear it on the video, but Aaron shared this with me. And she asks a question, and her question is, when is Brother Jeff going to start preaching? <laughs> When's he going to start preaching? And and, and Aaron looked at her and said, well, it, it's just, it'll be a little bit longer, a little bit long. I don't know if Caleb put some extra songs in that week or whatever. He just wanted to stretch the music out. But the music was still going. And if you'll even listen to this video, her own mother is singing in the background. But she's tired of it. And she doesn't, she's ready for Brother Jeff. And that just blessed my heart. But he, she said, when is he going to start preaching? And he said, well, it's going to be a little bit longer. And I want you to see her response. It's classic. Is, is that not great or what? I mean, that is, it just blessed my heart. Uh, in all my years of preaching, I've been doing it for a long time, I've never had a person beat their head against the furniture anticipating, waiting, longing for me to start preaching. <laughs> it's just never happened. Hey, I want to commend them. They're raising their girls the right way. But not only are they raising their girls the right way, they're raising their animals the right way. This little short clip is of their dog notice who's preaching in the background but their dog comes in to join our online service so take a look at this you have to go take and listen the same thing is true about our christian life okay listen to this part god has already given us some blessings listen to this ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 Blessed be the God and Father. <laughs> Is that not wonderful? I mean, those ears are just per- perked up like that. Listen, I don't have deacons that pay attention like that. <laughs> I really don't. It's amazing. They're raising their girls right. They're raising their animals right. And so I just thought that would be a blessing to your heart like it was to mine. All right. Hey, listen, what I want you to do, I want your ears to perk up right now because we're going to get going, okay, in Joshua chapter 1. Now, let me just say very quickly, last week, what, what did we learn? We learn that God has a place of prosperity for us. Now, listen, we're not talking, not talking material. Now, listen, he may bless material, and he does, and we thank him for that. Man, we're abundantly blessed. I think most of us will say amen to that. But it's not so much in the material. It's the spiritual realm. God, what, what we're learning is God has some treasures, and he wants us to take those treasures. Uh, he, he wants us to go get them. He said, I've already given them to you. Everything you need, I've given to you in Christ Jesus. He, in other words, he said, I've got a plan for your life. I have a purpose for you to fulfill. I have victory for you, victory over sin, victory over Satan, victory over the, this whole world that we live in. I've got adventure for you. I've got excitement for you. I've got joy and peace for you and a host of other everything, he says. But you have to take the treasures that I've already given to you. And so that's what we've been talking about. Now, I think it's very important that I share with you the typology. Now, we went over this in great detail last week, so I'm not going to I'm not going to take as much time. So if you didn't listen to that message, haven't watched that, go back and do that. I think it's very, very important, especially as we go through this series, to understand this typology. But let me just very quickly state these four things, okay? Number one, Egypt pictures the bondage of sin. Now, what did we say? We said the Hebrews, the Jews, they were in bondage in Egypt. They were actual slaves for hundreds of years. And so what is that a picture of, a type of? Well, it pictures the fact that we are in bondage as well. Our bondage is to sin, okay? So that's number one. Number two, 
Israel's deliverance pictures our salvation. And so they were in bondage, they were slaves, but they were delivered by the power of a miracle. Remember the miracle, that plague when, when God through Moses said, you take the blood of a spotless lamb and put it on the doorpost of your, on your house. And when the death angel comes, he will pass over that house and everyone in it will be saved. And so they were delivered from their bond. That's, that was the last plague and man, they were set free after that. And so they were delivered from their bondage by the power of a miracle. We too are delivered by the power of a miracle. This, it, that, that what happened to them is a picture of what happens to us. W- when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, we by faith take that blood of that lamb, God's lamb, Mary's little lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we pl- apply it to the doorpost of our heart. And so we are delivered from the bondage of sin through the power of the miracle of the cross and what God has done for us, okay? So that's number two. Number three, the wilderness pictures the carnal Christian. Now, what did we say? They were in bondage. God delivered them, and they went into the wilderness. But they were not to stay in the wilderness. They were to go right from deliverance through the wilderness and into the promised land. But because of sin and disobedience, well, they didn't, they didn't go. They actually stayed there for 40 years. God just killed them off. He killed off all those people who were disobedient, but they stayed in the wilderness all, all, those, all those years. Now, That is a picture over here in the Christian life is that we too have a legitimate uh, wilderness experience. Okay, God delivers us by the power of the miracle, the cross, the blood of the Lamb. And he says we too have a wilderness to go through. And that wilderness, we talked about it last week, is being a baby in Christ. And, and just like they're not supposed to stay in the wilderness, listen, we're not supposed to stay a babe in Christ. We're not to stay on the milk. God wants us to move from milk to meat and maturity and experience the promised land. So we, there is a legitimate wilderness experience, and he wants us to move through that quickly, just like he wanted them to do it, though they didn't do it. Okay, number four, the promised land pictures the victorious Christian life. Now, we said last week, the promised land is not a picture of heaven. There's, there was sin in the promised land. There was failure in the promised land and all these things. So it's not a picture of heaven. It is a picture. When they got into that land, they won battle after battle after. They won victory. And so that is a picture or a type of the victory that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ over sin, over Satan, over whatever, all the battles we'll face, and then there's rest and there's peace and there's joy and all of those things in the victorious Christian life. Now, let me just say this real quickly. Did you know, having mentioned those pictures, you today are in one of three places. Either you are in Egypt, you're still a slave to sin, you are lost, or You have been delivered, and you are in the wilderness. Maybe you're a baby in Christ. And listen, it's okay to be a baby in Christ if you you just gave your life to Christ a short time ago. But you know what's so sad is when I see, and you may know some as well, when you see a Christian, they've been a Christian for 20 or 30 years, and you know what? They're still babes in Christ. But some people are in the wilderness. But then, hallelujah, some people are in the promised land. They're experiencing the victory, the peace, and the purpose, and the plan that God has, and the victory over all of their enemies. They're experiencing the adventure and the excitement of the Christian life. And so you're in one of uh, three places today, and so which place are you in? Now let me just say this. You need to keep this in mind. As, as what, what do we say? God has treasure for us to take. He's given it to us, but hey, guess what? We have to go take it. He told those people, he said, listen, everywhere your foot treads, I've given you that land. But guess what? They had to go take it. So let me give you a timeless truth. Even though God has given us the promised land of victorious Christian living, his command is that we must still go fight for it and take the treasure he has already given us. Now understand, their battles were flesh and blood battles. Ours are not flesh and blood battles. Ours are spiritual battles. And so, and we do have an enemy. We talked about it last week. He prowls around. So we're going to have to face that enemy. We're going to have to face battles and, and wars and all kinds of things as we live this Christian life. But God has equipped us with everything necessary to be victorious. Okay? And so 
God has a place. He has a treasure for us to take. And we need, listen, it's like that song, have faith in God, have faith in God. He cannot fail. He must prevail. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. And so that's what they were doing as they moved into the promised land. And that's what I want us to do as we move into the victorious Christian life. Okay, so let's look at our passage, Joshua chapter 1. And uh, we're going to begin in verse 10. But hey, real quick, let me just say this. Last week, you know, verse 8, we, it says uh, we, we meditate on the Word. We proclaim the Word. Hey, we talked about memorizing the Word. You know one of the greatest verses you can start with? Well, there's so many of them. But since we're going through this... Hey, listen, why don't you memorize John, uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse 9? He, he says, Have I not commanded you, be strong and be courageous? Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Listen, that's what God would say to you in your life, whatever you're facing. What, what, are you going through a battle right now? He would say, man, don't tremble. <laughs> Don't be afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. For I, the Lord your God, I'm going to be with you wherever you go and whatever you face. That's a great verse to memorize, so I hope you'll do it. Okay, let's pick up in verse 10. We'll kind of read it as we go. So let's look at a couple of verses. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the midst of the camp and command the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves. For within three days you are to cross this Jordan and you are to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Now, I want to hang this sermon under three headings, okay? Number one, the provision that sustains us. The provision that sustains us. Now, if you go back and look in verse 11, Joshua gets the people together and he says, prepare provisions. Prepare provisions. Now, we need to understand the context, okay? The people have been in the wilderness for 40 years. And so all those sinful, the ones who disobeyed and didn't believe, no faith, they died. Now, they've all had children and more children. Their children have had children. So it's it's grown. As a matter of fact, the book of Numbers tells us that there are over 600,000, 601,000 and some odd that are are just men. So think about that. There are 600,000 men. Scholars tell us and estimate conservatively that uh, if you add their wives and the women and the children and so forth, conservatively, standing on the banks of the Jordan, getting ready to go into the promised land, listen, are 2.5 million people. 2.5 million. And so Joshua gets them up there and, and he says, hey, listen. I mean, and you think about it. They're standing on the banks of the Jordan. And scholars tell us that during this time of year, the Jordan River would have been swollen. It would have been a, over, almost overflowing its banks. And so here they are standing, and they're looking at this mighty river rushing in front of them. There's 2.5 million of them. And you would think, as Joshua is getting ready to command the people, that he might say something like this, prepare a bridge. That would have made sense. Or prepare some boats. That would have made sense. But what he says is, prepare provisions. Now, what's he talking about? He's talking about food. You say, well, what's, what's the big deal about that? I think it's a huge deal, okay? Because you've you got to understand what's been going on now for, for 40 years. When you think about food, what have they been eating for 40 years? Well, they've been eating manna. I mean, they ate, it, they ate manna in the morning, they ate manna at lunch, they ate manna in, at dinner time, and not only did they, eat, did they eat it three meals a day, man, they ate it 365 days a year for 40 years. Man, they were, they were, man, they had manna, okay? Now, do you know what manna means, by the way? The word, when you look it up, it means, what is it? And I'm sure the way it got its name was the very first day when God rained the manna down from heaven, they went out and they picked, it was, it's, it's a thin, coarse wafer. And they went out and they picked that wafer up and they looked at it and they said, what is it, right? 
I mean, what is, that's how it got its name. Listen, ladies, a lot of you can probably relate to this. I mean, you've watched a, a wonderful episode of the Pioneer Woman, and you've got a great new recipe, and you figured it out, and you, you've never served it before, and you go in and fix it and do all that stuff, and you bring it out to your family, and your, your kids look at, look at it, and they look up at you, and they say, what is it, <laughs> right? I mean, listen, you can understand what, what they're going through, but it was, it, was, it was manna, and so they were, as you'll learn, man, they got sick of manna, and God gave them some quail, a little quail. They, they complained. They were bored with manna. And they said, man, we've got to have some meat. And so God gave, God gave them some, a little bit of meat. And so for all these years, they're eating manna and quail all of this time. Now, now here's, the, here's the, some more a picture or typology, if you will. According to Exodus, yeah, Exodus 16, verse 31, the manna had a taste like honey. Now, now stay with me. It was not honey, but it tasted like honey, okay? So what's God doing? What is this about? Well, remember, when those spies went into the land, what did they come back and they said? They said, this is a land that flows with milk and honey, okay? So God says this manna, ta- the scripture says it tastes like honey. What's God doing? Man, he's giving them a taste of what is to come. He, he's, it's, not the, it's not the real thing, but it's just a taste of it, okay? It's, it's like when you go to, it's like an appetizer, right? If you ever gone to a restaurant and gotten an appetizer, you, you go in there and you, you order your, your little wings or your cheese sticks or you, some kind of little appetizer. Listen, appetizers are good. We love appetizers, right? But do you want to eat appetizers for the whole meal, for, for your breakfast, for your lunch, and for your dinner, and all you get is an appetizer. So, so God is, he's, I think he's creating a hunger. He's creating a thirst in their heart for what's to come in the promised land. Okay, So this is, this is, like, this is like an appetizer. And you say, well, why are you sharing all of this? What, what is, what's the importance of the diet? Here's the deal. What I want you to see, and I think it's important for us to see, and here's the typology again. I want you to be able, I want you to see that the scripture is differentiating between what they ate in the wilderness to what they're going to eat in the promised land. They had, listen, the wilderness wanderers had one kind of a diet, but the Canaan conquerors had a different kind of diet, okay? And so, and, and I think that's, I think that's so very, very important, um, God didn't want them to stay in the wilderness. He, his intention was never for them to eat appetizers and eat manna for 40 years. But that's what they did. But he, 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 was, he, giving, he was giving them a taste of what is to come. You know, I was reading the other day about, uh, you know what the po- most popular books are on like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or whatever? Did you know the most popular books, listen, are cookbooks and diet books? So what does that mean? Well, the cookbooks tell you how to make the food, and the diet books tell you how you ought not eat the food. Okay? I mean, how crazy is that? And those are the most popular books. Hey, I was reading about a California scientist who, um, I don't know, he's done done the research or whatever, but here's what he he learned. Here's what he says. I guess he, he figured this out some kind of way, but he said the average person, eats 16 times their weight in a given year. So, what do you weigh? You don't have to tell me. What do you weigh? Take your weight, multiply it by 16, and you'll figure out about how many pounds of food you're eating every year. Hey, guess what? He also found. While a human being eats 16 times their weight in food, did you know a horse only eats eight times its weight in food. So it's pretty clear. If you want to lose some weight, eat like a horse. Amen? I mean, just eat like a horse. That's, that's what you need to do. And so he's given us all this stuff about the diet. So, so, so why is he doing this? Well, because what was in the wilderness, listen, if you go back and read it, they got bored with what they were eating. They were tired of it. They, they griped about it. They complained about it. it was, they went through the motions. They, it was the same thing. Listen, it was the same thing every single day. Okay, listen, what is that? That's life in the wilderness. Okay? What they ate in the wilderness, it's, it, listen, it sustained them, but now hear me, it did not satisfy them. 
sustained them, but didn't satisfy. And so listen, what's going to happen is, Josh was saying, prepare some provisions that, listen, will not only sustain you, but will satisfy you, and that's what you're going to have. That's what you're going to get when you get into the promised land. You need, as you move from the wilderness to the promised land, a new diet. And listen, I'll even explain it. This, this, is, this is very, very important, I think. Did you know, when the, when the people came out of bondage, out of the wilderness, and finally, listen, when they finally got over into the promised land, did you know what God did? He, he instituted some feasts, okay? He says, I want you to have some celebratory feast to remember me, give me glory, and to remember all that I've done for you. And so that's what they would do. And so dads would get their families together, and they would, they would have these feasts. And so and they would use this as a teaching time, and that's what God instructed them to do. He says, use these times to teach your families about the past and what has happened. So, so let's, just, let's just imagine two scenarios, okay? We're talk, we're talk, that's what we're trying to talk. We're trying to differentiate between the diet of the wilderness and the diet of the, the promised land. And so let's think about the promised land first. Okay, here's a dad, and he comes, and he gets, he gets his family together, and, and he's doing all these things, getting ready. He's got, he's got all this stuff. And, uh, and, his, and his son comes up and says, Dad, what are you doing? He said, well, son, we're celebrating. <laughs> we're, we're celebrating the goodness of God. And he says, look, look right here. Look, we've got this milk, and we've got this honey, and we've got the fruits and the vegetables. And, the, and, and, and the, look, at, look around. You've got these streams and the farms and the mountains and this beautiful land. And God's brought. And we're just, we're just celebrating how good God has been to us. And that son he would look and he said, oh, we serve a great God, don't we, Daddy? He said, oh, son, we do. How great is our God? He is just so great. And they have a time of worship right there. Okay, so that's one scenario. But now I want you to imagine with me another scenario. Let's go over here to the wilderness. And there's another father and his family and the son and so forth. And, and they, listen, they've never been into the promised land. They've heard about it. They've been talking about it for years. But they've never experienced it, never been in there. And so here's a, a father and a son. The son's sitting over there on a cactus, and the dad's sitting over there on a hot rock or something. And, and so they're just, um, they're just going, Dad's doing his stuff. And the, and the son comes to him and says, Dad, what are you doing? He said, well, son, I'm, uh, we're, we're going to have a feast. He said, well, what, what's, what, do you, what do you mean? He said, yeah, we're going to celebrate. And uh, we're just going to thank God for all that he's done. And so the, the son kind of looks around. He pulls a quill out of his backside, and he saw, sees a rattlesnake sl slither by, and he's sweating, he's hot, and he's looking down at some old manna laying there, and, and he's looking, man, it's hot, and it's humid, and it's dry, and it's dusty, and he's just nasty, can't, he's dry as a bone. And he says, Dad, what in the world are we celebrating? Dad says, well, we're just celebrating how good God's been to us. And that young man looks around at all this stuff, and he said, Dad, if this is the celebration, man, I'd rather go back to Egypt. And that, that, that's exactly what they cl clamored about doing. They wanted to go back because they didn't like what they had. And so here, here's my point. Here's the application I want to make. We're talking about the wilderness diet, wilderness living versus promised land living. We're talking about what it means to our families. Listen, did you know there are many, many Christians, probably some who are watching here today, who are still living in the wilderness. And yes, it's, it's, it's going through the motions. It's boring. It's the same old stuff, and you're having to force it and do all of those things. But listen, and, and that's bad because that's bad for you. But guess what? It gets worse because it's going to reflect on your children just like those feasts. And what are we doing, Daddy? Listen, your kids are watching. Do you know, why, why in the world do we lose so many of our kids? I'm talking about our church family kids. Why do we lose them? It, it's, it's because they've never experienced the victorious Christian life. They've never seen it. They've never seen it lived out before. And you say, now wait just a minute, but I made my kids go to Sunday school. I made them, go, I made them learn that Awana verse and everything. And I, I, I lectured them about God and I made them feel guilty about this and that. Listen, that's not going to work. 
What they need is they need to see a mom and a dad who's living the victorious Christian life. They need to see a, a mom and a dad fulfilling the plan that God has for them, doing the purpose that he has for them, having experiencing victory over sin and over Satan and over this old world and doing it with joy in their heart and excitement in their life and, and anticipation. They need to see them worship. They need to see them serve. They need to see them give and go and all of those things and to do it with joy in their heart. Listen, that, that's why we lose so many of our kids because they don't see that. Because mom and dad are pretty, listen, they're pretty content to stay right here in the wilderness. Joshua says, prepare provisions. It's time for a change in our diet. Okay? So that's the first thing uh, we need to see. Num number two. Not only the provision that sustains us, but the power that strengthens us. The power that strengthens us. Now, let's go back to verse 11 again. Joshua says, prepare provisions for yourselves. Look, at, for within three days, you are to cross this Jordan River. Now, what's the significance of three days? Can you think of anything in the Bible that's very, you know, that's, that three days is pretty important? Uh, <laughs> does three days ring a bell with anything? Listen, our Lord Jesus, when he died, he was placed in that tomb. And what happened? Three days later, he came crashing forth from that tomb. Three days is very significant in the Bible. As a matter of fact, you go back and you think about old Jonah in the whale. He was in the belly of that whale for what? For three days. You think about Abraham and Isaac. All of this is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Abraham and Isaac went up that mountain, and Abraham's going to sacrifice his own son. And all, they were up there on that mountain for what? For three days days and so joshua says in three days we're going listen he could have said two days he could have said four days but he said three days and that's why i'm saying all the bible is about jesus okay never forget that all the bible is about jesus and so he says three days why because he's saying he's talking about resurrection power that's what you're going to have to have to go over and listen to experience the victorious Christian life. You've got to have resurrection power. And that comes through Jesus Christ. Let me give you a verse. Philippians 3 verse 10. Paul says that I may know him, that is Christ, and the power of his resurrection. Listen. We, we've got to have, listen, you're never going to live the victorious Christian life in your own strength. It will never happen. And God doesn't expect you to do it in your own strength. That's why he says, I blessed you with everything you need. Listen, if you go and try to do it, and that's what happens. Listen, that's what a lot of wilderness wanderers do. They try to force it in their own strength, and they fall flat on their face. They never experience that victory. That's why we have to have the power of the Lord Jesus. You can't force it. You, you can't go through the motions. We have to have that resurrection power in us. To, live, to listen, to go over and take the promised land and to live victoriously in that land. Listen, there's power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And that's the power we need to win the battles and to live victoriously. Number three, not only the provision that sustains us and the power that strengthens us, I want you to notice the problem that separates us. The problem that separates us. Now, let's pick up in verse 12, okay? Follow along. To the Reubenites uh, and to the Gadites and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said this, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you? And here's what he said. The Lord your God gives you rest and will give you this land. Your wives and your little ones and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan River. But you shall cross before your brothers in battle array and, and all of your valiant warriors and, and shall help them, that is, help your brothers fight, until the Lord gives your brothers rest and he gives you and all that they possess, the land which the Lord your God is giving them. Then you shall return, look at this, you shall return to your own land and possess the land which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you, look at this, Beyond the Jordan to, toward the sunrise, that is, toward the east side of the Jordan River, the sunrise side, verse 16. 
They answered Joshua saying, all that you have commanded us we will do and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obey Moses in all things, we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command and does not obey the words and all that you have commanded him shall be put to death. Only be strong and be courageous. Now, for the sake of time, let me just kind of very quickly say what's, what's going on here. Joshua is getting three tribes together, and he's reminding them of something that Moses told them a, a, a while back, okay? And, and that was this. There were, there were three tribes. See, remember, all the people are coming. They're, they're leaving the wilderness, and now they're coming up to the banks of the Jordan, and here they are, and they're getting ready to go in. But the three tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, they look around and they say, man, you know what? We kind of like it over here. We, 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 we like this land. This is, a, this is a good land. We're content. They're on the sunrise side, the east side. The promised land's over there. And they say, we, uh, we, I just think, we, well, I think we're just going to stay right here. As a matter of fact, you know, everybody knows we're lovers and not fighters. We just don't really believe in fighting and all of that stuff. And so we're just going to stay right here. And man, Moses, man, the hairs on the back of his neck stand up. And he said, okay, let me tell you something. The word of the Lord. You will not do that. Listen, we came out of Egypt as one people. Yes, we were 12 tribes, but we came out as one people, and we're going into the land as one people. Okay? And you're going to go over there, and you're going to fight with us. You're going to fight with your brothers, and we've got many, many battles, and you're going to fight in every one of those battles. And when we win all those battles, and there's peace and rest in the land, if you still want to, then you can come back over here and live on the wrong side of the Jordan River. But you understand, we're going over there to fight, and you're going to fight. And so Joshua, is all he's doing is, is he's reminding them of what Moses has already told them. He says, you're going to go fight. As a matter of fact, there's a verse in the Bible, we kind of misuse it sometimes, but it's talking about this. Moses warned them, said, listen, you're going to go over there and fight, or you be sure your sin's going to find you out. In other words... God's going to punish you if you don't go over there and fight with us. And so that's what they do. They, they decide, okay, we'll do it. We'll go over there and fight with our brothers. And, and so they go over and, and, and they fight. So, but, but here's the thing. What, what does this mean? Here's what's happening. There's, there's a separation being made. You've got... The nine tribes, that they're, they're, going, they're saying, we're going to go take the promised land. But you have three, three tribes that say, you know, I don't think we really want to go do that. We are pretty content over here. We, we just like it over here. Man, no battles. and Yeah, you know, it's, just, it's kind of this, this and that. But we're, you know, we're okay. You know, no, it's, not, it's not milk and honey. But, you know, we want to be close. We want to be right here. We want to be close. We want to be close to all the people who go in. And, you know, we want to be close to our friends. And, and Brother Jeff, you know, we, 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 want, we want you to go on in because that's the kind of pastor we want. And, but uh, there are people just like that. But they say, man, I, I don't really want to go in. I'm content over here on the wrong side. And listen, so many people have become content in their life, in their Christian life. And it's not the victorious Christian life. It's the faith-forced life. That's the wilderness life that God never intended to, for us to have. And so these three tribes, what do they do? Well, they go over there and fight, and you know what? Lo and behold, they do come back. And it just baffles me, and I, I was thinking about that, and I said, what is the application? What does that mean? And then I got to thinking. It hit me. Man, I've been a pastor for over 30 years, and I've seen the same thing. I've seen the same thing. I've seen people come. And, man, they're so excited, and they give their lives to the Lord, and they're delivered from the bondage of sin. And, man, they're so grateful for the mercy and the goodness and the grace of God, and they're so excited. And, man, they serve, and they volunteer, and they give, and they go, and they do all of those things. And you just see the fire and the passion. But then something happens. I don't know. It could be a whole host of things. But something happens, and feelings are hurt, or just get, get, had to work on Sundays for a few weeks, get out of the habit. I don't know. Some, something happens. And before you know it, you know what's happened? They have gravitated back to the wilderness, back to the carnal Christian life. Oh, everybody's doing it, and it's not that big a deal. And there's no passion. There's no hunger. There's no fire. It's just the doldrums of the wilderness life. And so what happened to them 
Oh, my dear friend, it happens still today. And so, man, I would just ask you a question. Listen, if you're in the wilderness, man, why not come out? Listen, God has so much more. He has everything for you in the promised land. He has victory for you. Why not come out and experience His plan, His purpose, His peace, His joy, the excitement, the anticipation, the beauty, and the blessing of the promised land? Man, why wouldn't you do that? You know, one of the, God, God has said, I've already given it to you. He said, I've got provisions for you. He said, uh, man, I've got power for you. You're not having power. You're trying to do it on your own. Man, God says, I've got all that stuff for you. The victory's yours. I, I've given you victory. I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Ben-Hur. It's a, it's a classic. I mean, it was a, uh, it won, I think, more Academy Awards or whatever the awards are than any other movie um, in history. It, Charlton Heston was in that movie. He was, the, he was Moses in the Ten Commandments. But this is a little bit different. It was Ben-Hur and... And uh, in that movie, Charlton Heston was to, there's this great chariot race, and they're just going in a circle, riding on these chariots with these horses and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and, and Mo, he, he had, Charlton Heston had never been on a chariot, and he didn't know how. And so he got on there, and he was trying to do it. The director of that movie was a guy by the name of Cecil B. DeMille. And so Charlton Heston is out there, and he's trying. He can't. He can barely stand up in the chariot, much less get them to go and go its way. He wants them to go and to go fast in a circle, which that's what they were trying to do. And he was so frustrated. He finally came to the director, and he said, "Mr. Demille, he said I can't do it. He said I, I. He said I can barely stand up in the thing, much less get them to go and tell them which way to go and all of that." He said, "I will. Ne-. He was supposed to win the race. He said, I will never win." This race. And Cecil B. DeMille looked at him and said, Charlton, he said, your job is just to hold on to those reins and stand in the the chariot. He said, my job is to make sure you win the race. And, you know, I got to thinking about that. That's what God is saying to us. He's saying, you're going to, I've got victory for you. He said, I've got, a, I've got a land for you. I've got a prosperity for you. I've got victory for you. Oh, listen, what do you want, what do you, what do you want me to do? Lord? He, I just want you to stay in the chariot. I, I, I just want you to look to me and long for me and hunger for me and seek me and, 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 and pray to me and, and watch me and anticipate me. If you'll, just, if you'll just stay in that chariot of faith, he said, you leave the victory to me. I guarantee you'll get it. And so I ask you today, <laughs> listen, what are you waiting for? Listen, and don't you want your kids to see victory? And don't you want to tell them about how good God is and his blessing, what he's done for us in Christ? And so the question is, do, listen, do I want to stay on the wilderness diet, forcing this and going through the motions there? Or do I want to experience the victorious Christian life? The answer is pretty simple. I don't, I don't understand why anyone would say, Yeah, I'm pretty content to stay over here unless you just got the world all in you. So it's time to come out. And I I just pray that today you you would, by faith, take take the possessions, take the treasure that God has given you in Christ Jesus. Would you join me in prayer? Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for these beautiful pictures that all the Bible, every single page is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And We thank you for that today, and I pray you've opened our hearts and our minds to these truths. I do pray for anyone, number one, who may still be in the wilderness, that, Lord, today they, by faith, would turn from their sins and receive Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, and come out and be delivered from their sin. I pray that today they would be saved. Lord, I pray for others who may be in the wilderness. Lord, they're babies in Christ, and maybe they've been a baby in Christ way too long. And I pray you'd grow them today. Help them to, by courage and by faith to say, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward. I, I, I'm tired of the wilderness diet. I'm moving to the promised land diet. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to come out. May, that we all may experience the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. And so, Lord, I, I just, you know the needs out here. You know who's watching. You know who's listening. You know who's stayed with us this far. And so, Lord, I pray that you administer to their heart meet them right at the point of the need, and we would all 
called before we turn this service off that we would be obedient as your spirit leads us. That you might receive the glory. How great, how great, how great is our God. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, man, thank you for joining us today. I say it every week, but I really, I'm just so humbled you would do it. And I also say this about every week. Man, if we can help you, man, we want to do it. We really do. And so please contact us here at the church, and, and we'll help you any way we can. Be in prayer. Church family, now I'm talking to you. August the 30th. Man, we're looking. If we can get all these lights fixed and the audio and video, man, we've kind of been piecemealing things. But, man, if we can get it all fixed, that's what we're looking to do on August the 30th. And, man, continue to pray for this pandemic that God would put his hedge of protection around us, okay? And so, man, I love you. God bless you. Thank you for, again for joining us today. You have a great rest of this day. And may you be the salt and the light that God has called us all to be that we might show forth the love of Christ as we go into our week. Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Moses had stage fright And David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked twelve outside us Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that Talking to me, saying, Who's who you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me and gave my heart a song to sing, I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus.